Welcome, everyone. I'm Christine Brown. I am um, an interpretive historian in the Outreach and Education Program. And I have the pleasure today to introduce to you Montana Historical Society Board of Trustees President and longtime educator Hal Stearns. Welcome, Hal. Well, thank you. Um, as you know, Hal is going to tell us about the Jawbone Railroad, uh, which is the 157-mile stretch of the Milwaukee Road, Railroad between uh, Lombard and Lewistown. Um, this uh, colorful story about Richard Har is mostly about Richard Harlow, who, um, without adequate financing, talked or jawboned his way into um, creating uh, the Jawbone Railroad. Um, as many of you know, um, there is no one better than Hal to jawbone about this topic. <laughs> I, I want to know who said, gave you that line. I didn't write that. Uh, Hal is a longtime educator and learner. Learner. He went to the University of Notre Dame, University of Montana, uh, the Army's um, Officer Candidate School, and War College. Uh, he spent 34 years in the classroom. He has led tours coast to coast and lectured in over 48 states, Germany, England, Japan, Korea, and Brazil as well. Uh, currently, he's an instructor for the University of Montana's uh, Lifelong Learning Institute and for Humanities Montana. Uh, as you'll see today, he has a particularly fond interest in sharing his passion for Montana history uh, with community members, students, teachers, and administrators. So please welcome Hal one more time. Good. <laughs> Okay, uh, I think uh, I want you to put that on for a minute, and we'll just see. You people said you've been around the block a little bit. Okay, all right. Let's just see. Let's just see here for a minute. We'll listen to a little bit of this for a second and see if you've been around or not. Okay, it is a group. Uh, it is a group that is very important to me. Um, they were uh, ones. They were called the Singing Sons of Beaches because they, they kind of headquartered out of Polson, and one of them had been one of my former students, and the other one, um, one, one of the others, um, sang at my wife's and my wedding in Glendive, Montana. He has since passed away. The, the, other, the third one who did the singing on this one was the only one that I didn't have a close connection with, but I always just thought that this was a, a great way to say something about where we are. I'm always amazed when I travel how many times uh, when uh, you visit with somebody out there, where are you from? And if you say Montana, there is something that is just magical. It just seems to catch the fancy of whoever you meet up with. There is something that is special about this place that we call home. So I was thinking maybe we ought to come up with a couple of names. What do we call it? Let's see, the Two Seasons State, South of the Loonies and the Boonies. Yes, in the U.S., uh, remote possibilities. At least we aren't Utah, Alabama, Maine, California, Texas, and on and on and on. Come to visit, just don't overstay. Lunch with the Grizzly, outer rim of the middle of nowhere. Exodus to Southern California begins here. Endless place to drive through on. Why do you like those? Pretty good? Yeah. Okay, let's see some more then. <laughs> Bring your parka. Oh, yeah. Where the tourists and the buffalo play. Mm, get lost somewhere else. Why wouldn't you visit? We don't actually want you to come here. We'll certainly accept your tourism dollars. <laughs> we don't want you to stay, but leave your money, huh? Not northern Wyoming, but not southern Alberta either. Mm -hmm. 60 mile an hour, breath of fresh air. Hard to get to, hard to leave. Excitement, well, good place to work in your, on your melanoma. Mm -hmm. Hot bed of troubled loners. The place that hip forgot. Mostly flat, ha. Huh? You won't know unless you try. Where you can get beer, barely hide anywhere. Um, barely hide. Nothing like getting lost somewhere between here and there. Mountainous, not... Monotonous, just stay on a main road. There's only four. <laughs> Easy to get lost, difficult to be found. Like North Dakota, only further west. Howling wolves, marauding grizzlies. Edgy moose, welcome all. You like nukes? Good place to get bucked off. Vast winds, swept scary, where fun and injury appear to go hand in hand. All the disadvantages of country living. Okay, one great big lot full of Ford F-150s. <laughs> Where coordinated search and rescue, commonplace. State with a weird shape, close to nowhere you can see it. Beautiful chanting, really expensive, right? Again, way cooler than Texas. Make sure you visit in January before you decide to move here. Or California light, mm -hmm. Miles of gravel to travel, our bears need to eat. 
we're not smart enough to tax your vacation dollars spent here so you can stay longer. Welcome to Montana, now go home. We are full, <laughs> park it in Montana. So how'd you like those? <laughs> the Great Falls Tribune, a couple of years ago, uh, just asked their readers, come up with a few other names for Montana. And I just happened to gather them up over a long period. And I got such a bang at them that I, when I'm talking, doing one of my non Montana programs, I just kind of like to show it because we can all identify with one or two or 25 of them. You know, it's just kind of something that's kind of cool. Well, big, beautiful, berry full. Uh, not for the meek, they're welcome anyway. Well, you really need to get away from choose Unabomber country, Montana. <laughs> the best last place, West Petting Zoo ever. Code of the West, why Montana's the best. Trade your crowded places, our open spaces. Lewis and Clark weren't here on a, on a lark. Where the Missouri begins, the dream never ends. Ask Custer about Montana. <laughs> Whole lot of nothing. Follow the footprints of Lewis and Clark. The best country in the country. Hut! No, Montana's not part of Canada. Big fun under the big sky. There ain't nothing out here but blue sky and cow poop, quoting the movie Disorganized Crime. Big sky, no lie, hunting, fishing, not wishing. You should fill this empty, beautiful space. No room at the end. We got big buttes. We cannot lie. Trump's Montana, since I'm going to the fourth time now, they are now renamed it Biggest Huggest Sky Country, home of the MAGA safe spaces. So those were the ones. I didn't leave any of them out. I just left what was in the paper from people that sent them in, but I thought it was kind of cute to what they did. Now, you know, here, miles to go to see it all from anywhere. And just look at those names, see if you recognize a few of them. Miles to go to see it all from. So if you've been to these places, you've definitely seen Montana. And I have to admit, I am still on the road with a way to go. And not long ago, I was up giving a talk up in um, a Libby. And so I had to stay up there for an extra day to, to drive all the way around, had to go out and see all the lake country and had to go up to the, the border, you know, it was all closed off at the moment, you know because of everything that was going on at the moment. But it doesn't matter where I go. I grew up in little Harleton, central Montana, and married a girl from Glendive. And my uh, grandparents had a cattle ranch uh, near Whitehall, and my other set of grandparents homesteaded between uh, Anaconda and um, Deer Lodge. So I kind of feel a little bit like, and I live in Missoula now. And at one time, we lived here in, in beautiful Helena. So now I'm going to war let's warm up with a quiz. I said, this is, this is not a giveaway. You people came here, you're going to work for this now. Are you ready to go? Everybody's ready. Okay, let's see it. So what's toponymy? Fourth or five corners of Montana, the smallest incorporated town, wanted to change its name to Joe. Montana's last county created the license plate number. Two most popular high school mascot names. Montana town designed around a central block with streets forming a radiant pattern from corners. Small state park, number of miles northwest to southeast. Brought us this county seat of what county? County seat of Weibo, Robber's Roost. Why St. Mary famous in the news, town made famous because of big races, free enterprise rate on mine. Anybody got them all? All right, anybody? All right, who, who's got number one? Toponymy. Nope, all right, who's got number two? Nope, good. I'm glad you're here. This is obviously <laughs> remedial. <laughs> There's more. All right. Smallest Incorporated? Ismay. All right. Ismay. The famous Ismay. I met Joe Montana one time. He, like me, he was over when his, one of his sons was playing football at, at the University of Montana. And he was there for a spring game. And my son and I, both Notre Dame undergraduates, and we went over. We had a wonderful chat with Joe. And I always said to him, you know, I said it again before I left him. I really wish that you would have gone to spend a little bit of time over there. I think you would have really liked beautiful Ismay because they, they, they really wanted to honor you. So our last county created, Lincoln. two most popular, huh? Lincoln, you think? Popular high school mascot, anybody think so? Huh? Okay. Small, small state park. Do anybody know any of those? What is the matter with you people? All right, here we go. All right, that's the study of place names. Yeah, so, okay. Four corners of Montana, here they are. Yak, Alzado, Westby, Manita, and Darby. Now, Darby really was not 
considered until Menida didn't have any people living there at all. So they said, well, we're the, we're the four. So I like to say, well, I guess there are five. The smallest incorporated, you know that one. Okay. Last county created in the license plate number. Now, this is going to surprise you. All right. Get this. It's petroleum, but petroleum got 55. Where's 56? Lincoln. Where's one? Are we ever going to change them? No way. Just understand. All right, two most popular high school mascot names? Bulldogs and Panthers. Mm -hmm. Montana Town is designed around a central block with streets forming a radiant pattern, and it's not that far from where you are right here. If you are driving up toward beautiful Great Falls, sometime go through Sims. If you are up in the air in a helicopter over the top of Sims, you will see how it comes out with the streets lining with a radiant pattern. It's amazing. And you'll see it when you go up and drive around it. So sometime give it a shot. The smallest state park is Elkhorn. Anybody know where Elkhorn is? Huh? Where? On the way to Missoula? Maybe not is right. Who knows where it is? Where is it? East of Older, that's right. And a little south. Number of miles north, west to southeast. Now, this surprises people. 884. County seat of what county? Now, this one's a toughie. Powder River, number nine. County seat of Weibo? There you got it. Good. You know, I carry the little diagram in my car with me. I don't like all these hotshot licenses like this. I, and I, I've even got my grandkids with those little cards in their car, and they're always trying to go through the 56. And I think it's just kind of fun. What in the heck is somebody in Weibo doing way over here? License plate 52. Okay, Robber's Roost, Alder. Why is St. Marie famous and in the news? Glasgow Air Force Base. Uh -huh. Town. By the way, that was the last Air Force Base created. And if you ever get a chance to go up and drive through that whole area, you will just shake your head. It's bad. It's bad. Yeah, yes, it's very bad. Town made famous because of the pig races? All right. And who has not been to Bear Creek? All right, now you people have got to get out of town. <laughs> you go to Red Lodge, and you just go up over the hill a little bit, not like you're going in the park. Just go east a little bit, and you'll go to the pig races, and let me tell you, you will not go wrong. You'll have a bow watching them with the pig races. The free enterprise rate on mine now, Boulder, you know, remember how that was in the news a lot. All right, enough of all that. We're warmed up. Some of you are awake now, so we'll see if we can get going here. Okay. Now, if we would take a look at a, a railroad that was really important to me as a kid, and this is a personal story now, and that is where I grew up in Harleton, you, and you all got the little map here so you get an idea of what I'm going to be showing you some pictures of, but in my hometown the electric uh, engines were put on and they went all the way across and all the way over to Avery and Idaho and the map over here which is awfully hard for you to see but if you take a look and this would have been true with every single railway that was ever coming to the west so if you get here at Miles City and just work your way all the way up there to Tacoma that gives you an idea of the mileage that each one of those was so say where we were from <coughs> Bill Jones and I and uh, Mr. Johnson back there. So there's two dot at 404, and here's Harleton, or 4111, and here's Harlow at 4117. So that's how close they were to each other in that day and age. So the electric engines gave a different concept to things. And this really intrigued me an awfully lot because why was it that you had the Great Northern and the, you had the uh, big railways of the South? Um, the, all of them uh, had these great big engines and everything, and they, they didn't need to use electricity. And you know, when you drive around in some areas of Montana, you can still see uh, what is left over from the days of the old Milwaukee Railroad when they had these power stations that they had to have out here. So this was typical of what the yards would look like um, for the Milwaukee Railroad, quite unlike so many others. 
And you know, when any of you ever rode the train when you were kids, you probably picked up one of these. The world's longest electrified railroad, 649 miles of transcontinental line, now operated by white coal. Yeah, mm hmm. So, America's road to victory, boulevards of steel and stamina. You know, the railroads used to advertise like crazy. And some of them were very interesting. So here are a couple of them give you kind of a warm-up. And I just love these old railway pictures. And there was a, a famous super dome. Look at what those domes look like. Any of you remember riding in any of those old rail cars? Yeah. Pretty cool, huh? Neat pictures. Yep, mountain climbing the Milwaukee way. No, why am I focusing on the Milwaukee? Well, because that's the railroad that went through my hometown. So there's a good reason. And there's got to be another reason. So here's Harloton. And if some of you look closely, like my little sister back there, she looks right back there, she can see our house. Because we only lived a block and a half away from the railway. And guess what? Every single one of our neighbors worked on the railroad. And that was true for many, many Montana towns. The, those railway towns, that's life and life, really, was the railroading. And then you'd always have the, the kids like Bill Jones over there whose family ranched. So it was either ranchers running the grocery store, getting you some fuel, or working on the railway. That was pretty much what people did. Whoop, I'm going one too fast. Now, at one time, you had, over in the, that area of Montana, you had these great big containers where you would bring in and have um, what was going to get, later get processed uh, for grain. And that was a very, very common use in these towns. That's one of the things I like about going through these towns. If you drive around, maybe you'll get a semblance of why they had what they had in an earlier day. Um, sometimes we see these out in the open prairie and I always think that maybe the best name in the world for them would be um, um, Prairie Castles or So there's the depot in Harlow which by the way has a museum there now and there's our house block and a half away from the railway so as a college kids going to Notre Dame I could get on the train in Harleton at one o'clock in the afternoon and be in Chicago the next day at one o'clock. And then you'd get off the train, take a cab, and go for about a 20-minute ride and get on a train called the South Shore Limited, and that would take you down to South Bend, Indiana. Now, what was the neat thing about all of that? You met kids as you traveled who were going to colleges and universities from Seattle all the way to the other end of the country. So you made pals with all kinds of, of folks and on trains because you went so long and you know college kids you couldn't afford to have sleepers so trying to sleep in those cars you would love it if you got to get on the train and you had one of those double seat things to yourself oh that was fabulous if you had that whoop I went one step too far again um, now this is kind of the monument to the Milwaukee that's in Harleton today it's one of the, what has been one of the electrics, the East 57B, and it's right up there on the edge of Main Street. Now, here are the kinds of power facilities that are out there in many places in Montana as you drive around. And you'll see some wonderful places where you see where the old railroads were at one time or another. Some of you might remember something like this. Anybody ever get to go to ride for one of those? And in our town, we had somebody else who was kind of an intriguing dude and his name was Smoking Boomer and he would come and he would greet everybody at the depot. People would get off and you know how we are with pets. You know, we're all that way. If you see somebody with a dog, you just, oh, can I, you don't mind? Oh, sure, go ahead. Be careful. Well, Smoking Boomer was um, Harlow's official train greeter. Mm -hmm. Now, this was the hotel, the Graves Hotel, which for a number of years now had been had been vacant, but in, now I'm glad to see some folks have bought it now, and they're going to try to, to perk it up and get it going, and I think it's going to be, uh, Bill, what are we going to call it? What, uh, that kind of living? 
a vacation rental by owner, something like that, B and B, something like that. Um, but a lot of people rode the rode the trains and would go to these railway hotels. Yep. Uh, how did you keep the power going through all those trains? Okay. Anybody know the answer? How? Yes. How? How did you get the power for the trains? Generation stations, Generation stations along the way. That was those big block things that I was showing you. They used uh, water generation? Or? In some instances, used water generation. Mm -hmm. A lot of electric power. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Oops, somebody else. Yep. And, and some argue even to this day, would we be better off if we went with the, uh, the electrics? All right, now, this is the main street of our town. Now, like so many Montana towns, you know, towns very often have kind of slipped from what they used to be. You know, the student enrollment in the schools or um, how often things like uh, hospitals and medical attention like that. Uh, sometimes those little towns really kind of struggle away. But I'm amazed when I go out and talk in small towns, there is something that is so special. It's our town. We love it. We ain't going anywhere. It means a great deal to us. And I'm thrilled to be able to uh, say that in my little reports around. So there's our electric engine on display in Harleton. Now, one of the influences that sometimes you saw was some of the old roundhouses. Now, that's the old days of the roundhouse that was in Harleton. And it doesn't even look that good night now, does it, Bill? Not quite that good even now. But there's a move afoot to see if we could go back and restore something of the roundhouse. Now, why a roundhouse? Because that was an area where you did a lot of work on those engines. So Harleton was one of those kind of communities. Now, a guy by the name of Jim Sataki, who my dad used to always say was the best football player pound for pound he ever saw. But at any rate, he was the last Japanese native of our town. And you stop and you think of uh, the days of internment camps and stuff like that. In our town, growing up, families like the Yamamoto's and the Munitas and the Satakis, we went to school with each other. We knew each other. We were on ball games together. We took English class together. You know, it was just the way things were. So you could go across this viaduct and you go over to an area, and it wasn't anything anybody saw as derogatory. It was just called Jap Town because a lot of people came out to help build the railroads. That was very common. So these are pictures from the Harleton days of the Japanese families in our, in our hometown. And they were often major railway builders. So now here are a couple of the beautiful places. When you drive around any town that has a railroad track, or there was a day that they had the railroads, <laughs> Go and take a look at these magnificent buildings. This is one of them that is in Missoula, and it is a beautiful thing. Here's the Northern Pacific Depot, one end of the main drag in Missoula. Um, you see them in all kinds of great places, and sometimes you'll see some things that are really quite significant. For example, if you ever go up to Haver, you can see this wonderful monument to Jim Hill, who was one of the great Railway Builders, Hill County, named for Jim Hill. Jim Hill was a big time player when it came to the railroad game. So here's the Northern Pacific Railway now. And here you can see some of the other shots of, oh my goodness, it looks to me like we're in some little place called Helena, right here. There it is. Mm -hmm. And here was one of the great trestles. These trestles were absolutely astounding. Can you imagine how those were made and out of wood and how dangerous some of that work would have been? Now look at this one. This is the f famous one. And if you haven't done this, who, who's done it? It's unbelievable, isn't it? It is more blasted fun. Put it on your list. The Charlie Russell Choo Choo Dinner Train, 10 miles northwest of Lewistown, traveled to Denton over the Indian Creek trestle. Two other trestles through half a mile long tunnel. And you get dinner on it, and who knows, maybe there could even be a holdup. <laughs> might happen, just might happen. 
You just never know. So riding the train on a magical tour of Perry Mountains, rivers, lakes, and canyons. And that's what you see. Now, we've got a lot of these kinds of places in Montana where we have some kind of a little bit of a monument. Oh, I'm so fast with some of this. Okay, Jim Hill, Haver, Montana, Hill County, the Great Northern. Some of the other railroad builders, like the, the Golds, the Vanderbilts, the Harrimans, the Huntingtons, some of those are names that you're familiar with that we have been for, for many years. And then you get some of those interesting kind of tales too. A woman who passed away about maybe a year and a half ago, something like this, and she wrote a very fascinating book about a very short, 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 short rail line that was going to run from off the Milwaukee toward um, White Sulphur Springs, and it was the Ringling family that did this. This is a fascinating little account, and we have it in our little bookstore over here, by the way. But it was a circus dynasty where one of the sons absolutely fell in love with the area around White Sulphur Springs, and he thought this would be a great place for them to winter with all of their animals um, in the wintertime. He didn't know much about Montana winter, you can see. <laughs> that, that idea fell through very quickly. Uh, all right, now... Here is Ringling, Montana. So I'm always looking for place names. So like that piece I played for you, keep in mind, when I go traveling, I carry one of those books around, place names of Montana. I'm always looking at the place name. Where in the heck did it come from? Because we've got some fascinating places. Well, Ringling, now you know. It was the Ringling Brothers Circus. And that's a really cool little place. The, the little bar there, they hang out. And here's what the main drag and the only drag is. And that gorgeous little church up there in the corner is just a beautiful little thing. So here's another couple of depots around for you. Yeah, love those depots. Yeah, here's the old depot downtown Billings. Yeah, here's Butte. So here was the independent record. 1883, first train, Northern Pacific to reach Helena. I came last evening, 8.30, loaded with passengers. Wow. 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 Man. And when they got there, there were buses and carriages and buggies. Some people on horseback and afoot to meet them when they got off the train. Yeah. Oop, can't take it. So... There's the inaugural run, Helena. I included that for you folks, since that's where we are at the moment. Now, the Butte Anaconda and Pacific only ran 26 miles. They said at one time it was the richest railway in the world because it was carrying the ore from Butte over to the smelters in Anaconda, the famous B.A. and P. Now, my favorite story, finally! Here you pay top dollar... And the guy hasn't even started talking about it yet. So, I guess it's time. All right, the jawbone. So, the Montana Railroad, and these are some of the names, alias the jawbone, and later on, of course, it gets pulled in by the Milwaukee. But let's see what happens. If you take a look at that little map that I gave to all of you, you have kind of an idea here, but I think you've got a pretty good sense because living here in Helena, you kind of know where things are. But here we are, Helena. We're going to go right down here toward a little place called Lombard. And we are going to cut over here toward Harlowton. And we're going up here as far as Lewistown. Okay. So we're going into central Montana. About a little bit of our story. Okay. Now, here's what it all looked like. The Great Northern, 1893. There's the Milwaukee, 1909. There's the Northern Pacific, 1883. And then a lot of people aren't aware that the Burlington coming up toward uh, Billings, 1894, and this one unhappily does not have the railway running south from Butte down toward Dillon, heading further to the south. I wish I had it on there. But now, the one that I'm going to tell you about mostly is going to be this little one that is going to hang out in the area where you see that name, you bet, Garneal. Oka, Severance Ranch, Martinsdale. I don't see some of the names I really recognize along here yet. Maybe they haven't come into being yet. 
Well, maybe they came into being because of this. Now, here's a fascinating account by one of those people who have devoted a lot of time, the Montana Railway, by Don Baker. But the man I want to talk about is this one. He's a fellow that moved out from Illinois, came here to practice law, and he was one who it would be best for him to be in a, in a drier climate. And he had this idea with all of his compadres here in Helena, I, have, I want to build Montana. Now, we've already got some railroads into Montana, but I want to build Montana. And I think the big idea would be if I would build a railway from Lombard south of Townsend, between Townsend and Three Forks, if you go right down toward Tostin, go south, keep going south, and you'd get to Lombard. His idea was, what if you built a railway that went through this area, mountains on both sides, going over to the central part of what is close to the center of Montana, then going north up toward Lewistown, and you would have tremendous traffic. You could carry passengers, you are going to carry grain, you're going to carry beef, and who knows, maybe we'll extend eventually all the way to Great Falls. Maybe we'll go all the way up toward Fort Benton or, or go all the way up toward Haver or go all the way over toward Glasgow. I mean, he was kind of a dreamer. So his idea was, I'm going to build a railway. Now you tell me, any of you think you've got enough cash to go out and build a railway? Well, he had a pretty good practice, but it wasn't that doggone good. So he got a bunch of his pals together who just said, you know, Harlow, you're a pretty good man. So he starts to build. His attitude was always the same. Never give up, never waver, and he was a hard charger. And that's what he liked to tell people with his law practice as well. If I handle your case, I will give you the best shot there is possible. And he was also a people person. You would have gone out and had a beer with him, and you would have had the best time going. He was that kind of a guy. People just liked to be around him. So he was easy enough to go along with. And he always was one of these. You don't see a tunnel that's going to go dark. It's always going to be the light at the end of the tunnel. Now that's optimism, I would say. And that's pretty much the way he saw the, the world. Well, he buys this canyon, 16 miles of a canyon. Who in the heck is raising cows, horses, sheep, in much of a canyon? So it was on a pieces of property that belonged to several different kind of ranchers. But he buys this, and he got it for nothing, literally. But then what difference? We, we're not going to use it in any, any which way. So eventually, the Milwaukee Railroad is going to have to buy the 16-mile canyon in order to build its railway. So in other words, did he end up winning? You bet he does. But this is a true Montana story. And remember I told you I played the music I told you all those Montana towns. Why do you think I have a love affair with this story? It's my town. And I think it's kind of cool that we all have a town of our own. I have another question. Yeah. How did, he, how did he know that Milwaukee was going to come? Well, you're going to find out. You just kind of got to hang in. It wasn't out there quite that far yet. But he got the drift. I'll tell you. If you had the Great Northern up and you had the NP South, what's in the middle? <laughs> That'll be the Milwaukee. Now, after I went to uh, Notre Dame as an undergraduate, I went off to the Army and I came out and I decided to go to graduate school. And I went to graduate school over at U of M, University of Montana, and I... Um, my advisor, after I finally had to, you know, I decided I was going to do something in history, and my advisor was a fellow by the name of, um, let's see, what was it? Let's see if I remember it. His name was uh, K. Ross Toole. Yeah. Um, so I was, I was at that point, and I go in the city and I said, Dr. Toole, you know, I've got my coursework all done. What do you, I got to find out some idea for a thesis. And he says, so I know where you're from. You're from Harleton. Yeah, I am. I know your dad, yeah. K. Ross, I think, knew just about everybody. And he said, well, you know, I don't know very much about that area of Montana. 
I think you've got a thesis. <laughs> so that's what I wrote about. And my thesis was entitled The Upper Muscle Shell of Montana. That's what I did in my story. Well, what do you think I came across? I came across a guy who built a railway. So I got very fascinated. And when I get all done with graduate school, and I get my first teaching job, and I'm still so curious about all of this, so I found somewhere a little snippet that said that the daughter of Richard Austin Harlow married a British officer. Now get this. I wrote a letter to the British Embassy in Washington, D.C. And I said, I am looking for somebody who was married to a Montana woman. And I would like to know if you know of or have any information about anything. And son of a gun, some lady who was working back there should have thrown the thing in the garbage. And she said, now this one's got me kind of fascinated. Because I did come across something about somebody who has a Montana connection with the British Navy. So son of a gun it worked out. I get a letter back from the British Embassy, and I get the name and address of a woman. And so I wrote a letter to a woman who was Richard Austin Harlow's daughter. And when I wrote her, it was the first time in my life that I ever wrote a letter to a lady. <laughs> lady Catherine Harlow Moore. And her husband was a fella by the name of Harry Moore. And when I went to visit them, now get this, I'm 24 years old, and I went back to Washington, D.C., and there is a fancy car, picks me up and takes me to one of their homes, their home in the United States. And I went up and had the most wonderful visit with Lady Catherine Harlow Moore and Lord Moore. And so the pictures that I have that are up here that are like this, these were all pictures that she gave to me. From the time she was a young girl and the family moved, she never came back to Montana again. Um, her father ended up going back east to practice, so that kind of ended that part of the show. And as it turned out, uh, this young lady went off to um, school and um, ended up marrying a fellow who was in, attached to the British Embassy in Washington, D.C., and they ended up getting married. And when my wife, Sheila, and I lived in Germany, we went to visit them at their home south of London, and I would refer to her during every conversation as Lady Moore, or she said, you could call me Catherine, Lady Catherine, and call him Lord Moore. And they treated me like I was something else because her dad built a railway. Her dad built a railway. So this is the first letter I received from her when I finally got her location in Washington, D.C. So here was the railway. You see where Helena is. You can see where Logan is down here. Here's Lombard, and here's the route, eventually getting all the way to Harleton, going all the way up to Lewistown. A couple names you recognize. There's Two Dot and Martinsdale. Maybe you've heard of some of these, like Lidboro and Dorsey, White Sulphur Springs. You know, that one I told you about, the Ringling Brothers Circus, all of that later on. But that was the railway. Now, the Montana jawbone, what happened, and this is very typical of a lot of railways in an earlier day, that there would be stage stops. There would be places where the mail was left or other mail was picked up. And a railroad became very, very important. So this little railway, which was only the 167 miles, well, let's see. He rambled to Montana, he went from town to town, and at last he got aboard the jawbone bound for Lewistown. He was three days going to Harleton and four days to you bet. 
And that was about a week ago, and he hasn't reached her yet. <laughs> now, we could go right on with that song, and I'll tell you, you get an idea about how people felt about the railway. Now, the old jawbone has been making time. The fact we can't deny was running pretty regular, and at times she tried to fly. But the same old odd thing occurred again. There's no use to buck, for somewhere out along the line in a snowbank, she got stuck. The jawbone is a rambler. The rambles everywhere. The way it gets to Lewistown would make a Christian swear. It rambles into a snowdrift someplace along the line. So the chances are that she'll get you here this time. Ha, ha. I wish I knew who wrote that. Because it is a classic, I can tell you. So at any rate, what happens here? This is what their official map looked like. This is, you can see, I couldn't find one better than this. I wish I, I had one. And here is a, one that they gave out to people if they were down at, at Lombard getting on the train and eventually getting all the way up to Lewistown. And here's what would happen if everything worked right. There's the timetable, October 8th, 1908. So you can see how it is supposed to go. So let's just go back to my hometown now of Harleton. 94 miles out, and there's 2.82, 12 miles apart. It should take 32 minutes to go the 12 miles by train. 32 minutes to go 12 miles. Yeah, you'd probably think it ought to go a little faster than that, but that's the way things were. So Lombard, you could get on the train at 2.30 p.m., and if all goes well, you are going to be the next morning, you're getting off the train, 157 miles at 7.10 in the morning. <laughs> you and I look at that and think, are you kidding me? What are they going, about 22 miles an hour or something like that? Sometimes people saw this, but this is what, what it all looked like. Now, why was there the other interest? It was because of gold. It was because it was a rich metal area. So some of you have heard of a place called Castle. And sometime when you go through central Montana on Highway 12, and you're going from White Sulphur Springs toward Harleton, and you see the sign that says Castle, take it. That's one of the ways to go to get there. And you will be astounded to see a place that has literally stayed unto itself. We've never been a great deal with it. It is just an old mining town with bits and pieces of it still there. Now, this is what Castle looked like in an earlier day. And it was like so many of those kinds of places that we're, we've all seen the cowboy movies. This was it. It had the miners, and it had the drinkers, and it had the bordellos, and it had a little school. It had everything. And here was the Cumberland Mine when things were really rocking and rolling. And here's some more of the mining activities. So here's a picture from 1985. And here's one from the same time period. You could just drive out and take a look at all of this and just smile and say, my goodness. And when you go there, I promise you, you're going to be the only ones there. There's not going to be anybody else. It's not Virginia City or Bannock. I can tell you that. So now here's some of the scenery of the 16 mile now. This was a deep, tough canyon. And the people that worked on it worked like crazy. Now what would happen is you would have these long teams carrying all kinds of goods down to where the railway was because before that, this is the way you had to move things from one place to another. Now this is an aerial view when it was really a moving place. Now here's the little town that came into being, Lombard. Lombard was just off the tracks of the Northern Pacific. And it was the Western Terminal, so at Tostin, just go a little south, and you can see where there's a little hotel even. But look at all the rail cutway cars that are sitting right there. And this is where people would take off if they were taking the train. So you could take a train from Helena down to Lombard 
and then you take another train from there on to Lewistown or whatever point you are heading toward. So these are some of the early pictures. And these are, these are the real McCoy. These are pictures taken from the ones that Lady Moore gave me. So I'm giving all my collection to this wondrous place after I told tell one or two more stories because I think it's a cool one. So here's the little roundhouse. And there's the mighty Missouri River right next door. Now we're heading into the canyon. Look at that. It went through that canyon. Now just imagine the people that worked on these things. Just imagine what it would have been like. And here's one of the crews. I've thought about this picture so many times. How many of them have families? How many of them want to have a life of their own? And do you ever get a day off? And how many times did you see this, where the family went right along with you, and you stayed in these kind of little tent towns? The family was just there. Oh, my goodness. Just imagine what it would have been like. Snowbound on the jawbone. One of the great stories is of a young woman who has taken one of these trains, and they get caught, big, big snowstorm, and they sit, and they sit. And in each one of those rail cars, they would have this stove that they would just keep feeding the wood in to keep things warm as best they could. And eventually, they've been there now for hours and hours, and this young woman goes up and says to the conductor who is going from one car to the other, said, excuse me, I'm, I'm just curious, when are we going to get out of here so I'm going to be able to get on to Lewistown? I need to get to Lewistown. And he looked at her, the story goes, and said, ma'am, haven't you ever heard of this railway before? She said, well, I'd like to go and see my family. And he said, well, I guess you're going to get there when we get there. And then he looked at her and he says, ma'am, you look like you're quite pregnant. And she says, yes, I am. And I want you to know I wasn't pregnant when I got on this train. <laughs> I did not make that up. Now, this was Billy Key, and he and his family had the hotel in Lombard. And the story goes that when they would go to bed at night, and this was probably true at hotels all over the place, they would just leave the keys to the rooms that were still vacant, and you picked up a key and went to bed. Now, when the Milwaukee bought it out, he and his family moved back to China. I would give anything to know whatever happened with that family. I have no idea whatever happened. But look at some of these pictures of... And this is the kind of story that in so many ways is just Montana all over again. In so many ways, in so many places where... People just gave their best. And look at these tunnels. A tunnel, 378 feet, 157, 312. I mean, how did, and then look at a family. Camped at the construction camp at 16, Montana. You imagine how hard that work would have been. Oh, it's just hard to picture. And then, now, there's got to be more to the story, though. Richard Austin Hartle, how's he paying the people that work for him? How's he going to pay those people? Mm hmm. Well, let's see. He got to the point where he didn't have anything left. So he got up on one of the rail cars that was as far as they had gone, and they're working on one of the bridges and tunnels that they have to make, and they're ready to string him up. And he gets up on there, and he says, men, I'm going to tell you something. We're all struggling right now. I've given everything I have to this railway, and you have done the same. I promise you, the day will come and I will pay each and every one of you, every one of these IOUs. And he held up a big batch of them 
like this. I will pay you for everything that you have done to make this railway go. And that's what he had to say to him. And then all of a sudden, there was something else that finally had to happen. When the Milwaukee Railroad came out, guess what they had to do? They had to buy the 16-mile canyon. That meant they had to buy a railroad that went through a place called Harloton that went all the way to Lombard. That's what they had to do. And so, guess what he did? He paid back every debt he ever had. And in that letter that I had back there that she wrote to me, one of the things that she said in there, and she told me this when we had a long conversation, and we were just sitting by a fire in, at their place in uh, Washington, D.C., and her husband is there, and he was just kind of smiling, and she described this wonderful parent's that she had, and how dad was just going to make a difference in the world. He just always was a guy who had kind of a vision, and he just thought that he would be, be able to make a go and make something better for Helena and for central Montana, and that's what his big dream was. He ended up uh, leaving Helena sooner than maybe... She, he really began to have major health problems, and so... He, he had to give up, and he moved back to the east. And he eventually uh, was an attorney in Washington, D.C. That's where he ended up. And boy, if I could go to the past, would I love to spend time meeting Richard Austin Harlow. But like I say, I was lucky enough to meet his daughter. And I'll tell you, it's the only lady I have ever met. Lady Catherine Harlow Moore. And I wanted her to come out to Montana. Because our hometown, every 4th of July, the 3rd and 4th or 4th and 5th, and there's always the big rodeos and fireworks, and we always have the big parade. I wanted her to come out and to be on the float at the front of the parade. And I said, Lady Moore, I'm not going to have you just do it in Harlow then. That's the name for your family. But we're going to go on and do the same thing when we get up around the Gap and Oka and on our way up toward Moore and on our way over to Lewistown. We're going to get you in more darn parades. I don't know. I never could convince her to come west. Boy, I wanted her to, though. So there it is. And I have to admit, I do a lot of Montana stories. But boy, do I love this one. This one is a treasure for me. So, there you are. That's all I got. That's all I got. Well, you've been, well, you've been, oh, I got a thumbs up? Yeah. Yeah, and I noted. <laughs> Thank you, Hal. Thank you so much. Um, we want to give everyone a chance to ask questions, but I'm going to come around with the mic so that our um, audience online can hear the question. Okay. Boy, the pressure's Working. on. Yep. Anybody okay. got one? Who's first? <laughs> there we got one way back there. Back, back there in the nickel seats. Hand over the mic here. Yep. I'm Hal's sister, and I love the story of how You Bet got its name. Well, good. <laughs> you Bet. You going to pay all those debts? You Bet. Hubert, Montana. Who's got one? Come on. Go ahead, Jeannie. But you said, the other story went to, they said, you want a post office, and they said, you bet. Really yeah, and office. that was the famous one at you bet. Um, that was up a, around Oka, um, and that's <laughs> between um, Judith Gap and on the way toward Lewistown, and that's really a cool area. But you know, there was the natural gap there between the belts and the, uh, and the snowies, or yes. the castles. No, not the castles. The belts and the... Snowies. Yeah, he is the snowies. And so that was a very popular area. That The stages, by the way, that came down from Fort Benton in the early days that were heading toward um, um, 
down to the mining camps of Virginia City and Bannock. They went right through that very area. But you know, Montana's got so many of these kinds of stories that are just so intriguing. You know, um, a lot of people aren't. I was, somebody was, we were talking about this a little earlier today about jo Joseph and the Nez Perce and that when the, they were trying to get, to the, uh, get across the border to the good mother country, that one of the areas where they, they crossed was just about 20 miles east of, um, of Hardleton um, between Chomet and, uh, and Rygate. And that was, that was, that kind of story is out there in so many, every place has a story. Every place. And that's why I am so thrilled. And I guess you're the one that I get to say thanks to because what we have going right here in this fabulous uh, museum and this great addition, we, we tell a great story here. There's no doubt about it. And I'm just thrilled with what we're going to have before we're done. And there are going to be a lot of stories that are going to be like the one that I just told you. You never answered my question. What was your question? <laughs> Well, how did he know that how Milwaukee did, was going to buy the canyon? Because there wasn't any other way to go. He had, they had to go through the canyon. Wow. They had to do it. And if you take a look at like the map I gave you, hmm, nope. You mean east of Mile City? Virginia. You speak pretty good English then for somebody from back there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Talk later. <laughs> my, uh, my grandfathers, grandfathers were all uh, railroad people. Their family and people formed the North and Western, the Southern Railroad. Wow. The CNO, the DNO. You know, how many others are in that boat? How many others had family, though, that had any kind of a railway connection? Did any other? Yes. You, you know, when you think about that, though, um, the railway, um, Jeannie and I, I think we could go around our block and the next block over and identify every family, and we would tell you that every one of those families had a connection to the railway. And those little railway towns were like that. Yeah, and boy, and that's real history too back there. Anybody else before it's time? Yes, ma'am. Why did they build the 16-mile tunnel into a edge of a cliff? Well, they had to put the bridge yeah, there. They didn't. They, it wasn't a case they wanted to. You had to. You had to make do with the cut that they had. They they knew what they were doing. And if you ever get a chance, I had a chance when I was doing the. The research in my community found out these railroaders were kind of <laughs> thrilled that I was doing something like this. I got to go on one of the railway cars where you'd take an auto, a real automobile that they would put on those, the, those wheels, and I got to, uh, to go through the whole canyon, uh, which was really, a, for me personally, you can imagine, it really meant a great, it really meant a great deal to me that I had that opportunity. I liked it. Yes, ma'am. How many years did it take to construct the? Oh, that's a good one. Well, yeah. really, his his dream got started in about 1900, and he ended up selling off to the Milwaukee in 1915. So they had it, but there were long stretches where, because of the weather, they had to just go some other way. So it took it took quite a while, um, and. Um, <coughs> He ended up, you know, as I told you, he ended up selling to the, to the Milwaukee. So he left and went east. But it, 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 took, a, it took a real time. Um, but, oh, my goodness, would I have loved to have ridden on that? That would have been a fun one. Yes. What is your version of the origin of the Jawbone name? Well, a lot of people say that the real thing was... When he, 
when he had to talk to the business people here in Helena, and when he was talk talking to those employees who he hadn't paid off, that he was using his jawbone. And so everybody claimed that really it was not the Montana Railroad, it was the jawbone because of the way he had to deal with things. But I would, boy, I'd give him anything to have met that guy. I think that would have been absolutely fascinating. Bill. Uh, just a, a comment about the uh, building in the canyon. The jawbone uh, stayed at the bottom of the canyon when they built, and I think they had 56 bridges where they cro kept crossing the creek. Well, every time they got a big downpour or a cloudburst, they would lose all these bridges, so there was always to have to rebuild this. When the Milwaukee built it, they elevated the track, and they're the ones that went up in, and went through the cliffs uh, with the tunnels. That's right, that's <clears> and okay. also at Loweth, which is uh, on the east side of that valley where it breaks down off into the Lenape side, uh, I followed that uh, track that went up the Leadborough up by Castle, and they, they ran the train to about uh, a mile from Castle. And, but they just sent a survey crew out and their crews, and they just started uh, knocking hills down. And, and I mean, it was just the optimism they had to go up through that country, up in the mountains, and uh, build that stuff. It's just mind-boggling when you think about it. They just, they just went and did it. They just did. There wasn't any environmental studies or anything like this or either. Or 40-hour work weeks or anything like that. 40-hour work week in three days. Yeah. Um, and you know, that whole area, since Bill brought that up, sometime when you're driving through, make the turn and go to Martinsdale, for example, but stop and see the bare, uh, beautiful museum and their properties, and then go down a little bit further and you'll see where the old Milwaukee track was, and make a turn and you can drive up and go up toward Lenape and go up, um, and it's so easy for you to go and take a look at, at Castle. It's not something that's hard to do. And you could make a round turn and get all the way out to where you go the, the road that would be going from White Silver Springs down toward Livingston. So you could just do a big grand circle and have a lot of it be on a highway, except for the cut when you went up to, to Castle. Was this railroad a narrow gauge or standard gauge? No. Was it a narrow gauge it was or a standard narrow, gauge? But the, when the, um, the Milwaukee, they, they, had, they had to convert. They Milwaukee. No, they, con they converted early on to being the standard gauge. They okay. had to. One more question. One more. Hi. I was wondering how the power of an electric locomotive compares to the steam. Well, who's, who's going to be give us an answer on that? Electric to steam. Can you do it? The electric engines outpowered the steam engines. It was a more of a steady power, and they were somewhat heavier. So they, they and they had more more horsepower. In the winter time too. Yeah, and they were yeah through the winter time too. Yeah, yeah and it was immediate. That's the other. That's. It didn't build up like no, a it wouldn't build up like a diesel. Anybody else? Guess it's time. Oh, we're going. Yes, sir. Did you find out how much the Milwaukee paid for? <laughs> no. I don't know what the, Milwaukee, the Milwaukee paid for. Paid? I don't know what they paid for it. I don't know if that was kept under the covers or... But I know he ended up paying all, every debt. I know that. But I don't know anything more than that. But am I going to keep digging? Yeah, I'm still interested in this one. All right, Hal. Oh, yeah. Thank okay. you so much. Well, you're very welcome. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. Well, keep coming to these. I guess you have these how often? Every other? Every Thursday. Every Thursday? Oh, good. Oh. No. Huh?